Portolan and this is the Slow Love podcast series produced in conjunction with Contento and today we have a really special episode because it's also a vodcast but we also have a really special guest who is Damien Walsh Howling. Hello Damien. Hello Lisa. Henry. Hello and so just to give him a little intro even though I had to cut down his biography hugely because he does have so many um, accomplishments on his end but he has a really impressive list of film and television credits and I'm sure you all recognize him from different performances but one of the critical ones that you may remember is from Underbelly where he played the uh, he was the personification of Melbourne's most loved murderer Benji which we might talk a little to today as well but some of his other accolades include the secret life of us stingers brothers in arms the time of our lives and all sorts of um, different TV credits, as well as film and theatre credits. And alongside that, you, you might know he's also a writer and director, and he has this fabulous short film, Messiah, um, which is starring David Galpalil, which is absolutely amazing, was sold to both SBS Australia and Amazon International, and two other short films, The Bloody Sweet Hit and Suspended, which were also which also opened a number of prestigious international festivals respectively. So a really, really long history in film, television and critically acclaimed. But he's also a, a very interesting person. And today we wanted to talk to him about his own interpretations around masculinity because it is such a moving target and it is such an important topic and intimacy as well. And obviously there's been a lot of discussion around toxic masculinities in the last couple of years. And we wanted to really subvert some of those ideas and get a sense of you know, how da Damien feels about masculinities and about intimacies. And I might hand over to Ruth my fantastic co-host to ask the first question. Thanks, Lisa. Hi, everyone. So great and so excited to have Damien here with us today. So Damien, I've known you for about probably about 20 years, which is a bit crazy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> amazing, really, when you think about it. <laughs> yeah, let's not think about that. <laughs> um, but, you know, the thing that's always sort of impressed me about you and that I really admire about you as a friend and as an actor and a, an amazing writer director is your great sort of humanity and compassion and sense of empathy. And I think that has been a big part of why you've really excelled as a storyteller and actor. Mm -hmm. You know, you're able to bring that real vulnerability to your work. And it is rare, you know, it, it is not an easy thing to do. And we're really excited to sort of unpack some of these kind of your thoughts around masculinity and your experience playing some of the characters you've played, which mm -hmm. have sometimes been, you know, highly masculine, sometimes toxic, mm -hmm. um, infamous, obviously, also with, you know, Lisa talking about Benji. Mm -hmm. So to kick off, I want to ask you firstly about your sort of experience of COVID. Um, mm. Mm. You know, at the beginning, it felt pretty apocalyptic, I think, to us all. And, you know, you, it might be interesting to kind of mm. think about the fact that the word apocalypse, actually, the Greek word doesn't actually mean destruction, but means revelation. Mm. So I'd love to kind of unpack with you what your experience has been with COVID, particularly being in Victoria, and whether you have found it more revelatory as opposed to destructive. It's interesting that you say the word revelation, because I think for me, the first thing that came up with COVID was a real, you know, a, a real sense of vulnerability, like, you know, and, and if not, if not anything else, just physical vulnerability and thinking about my family and my parents who are older and, you know, because it was, you know, it was sort of evident that it was affecting older people more in the sense of, you know, of, of bad health or it seemed to be. Um, and then, you know, just that initial sort of fear and the response to that in the sense of sort of, you know, I'll say it straight up initially, it, it, I think it made a lot of people feel this way, but I definitely was almost for a few weeks sort of a little bit OCD and not wanting to touch surfaces and really, you know, really concerned about, about actually getting it or spreading it to anyone else if I did get it um, to the point where I found that to be quite a revelation that there was so much fear inside me around around an external threat which I hadn't really thought about before um, and then as the time's gone on obviously you know we've come to learn more about it 
Um, and I think for everybody, we've sort of settled into the sense of, well, this is sort of, we're getting more of a handle on what it might be. Um, and for me, that's definitely taken away most of the anxiety around it, I think. Yeah, you sort of, we sort of went into survival mode, didn't we? Yeah, it's definitely, like, yeah, definitely. And I saw that people and it's, it, it's interesting because I think it's those sorts of things that make us feel vulnerable that actually do go to the heart of our humanity. Um, and you have a number of choices in that case, you know, and obviously fight, flight, freeze, whatever that might be. But beyond that, it's a choice as to whether you dig a little deeper to see, well, why am I feeling so fearful? Sure, the fear of, of getting sick or dying is, is relevant, but what is it in you that, that goes into that anxious space? And what is it that's, that's beyond that? Um, and I think that's a revelation in itself. I think whenever we're faced with a challenge, you know, whether it's to do with our health or someone else's health that we're close to or, or falling in love or whatever it might be, those things threaten a certain sense of our identity. And sometimes that's in a pleasurable way. And sometimes that's not in such a pleasurable way. And um, I think I, <laughs> I secretly wish I had have dealt with it with a little more external courage at the beginning. But now I look back and I go, wow, actually, you know, it actually taught me a lot about you know, about um, some of the things that were maybe lurking in the shadows for me in terms of where my fears lie. Um, I have a cousin who's very involved in the, in the sort of medical system and he was really ahead of the curve on the whole thing. And he suggested to me that, you know, this was back in March before the lockdowns in Melbourne that I potentially moved down to the coastal town where my parents live and where he lives and the extended family. And I did that and that's been revelatory <laughs> without mm. a doubt. So tell us about that experience. So you 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 fled from Melbourne, which is probably a great move. Yeah, <laughs> and, down and to the coast. Yeah, I did, and and part of the reason I did is because I I live on my own in Melbourne, and uh, my family, as I said, my parents were down here, and my brother and my extended family, and I'm really close to my family, and I just felt like I wanted to be in the heart of the family while this was going on. I got a sense, I got a real sense that it was going to be a big thing, and I did feel that the lockdowns were going to be quite extreme um, early on. I don't know where that came from. I think partly because my cousin was talking about it, but, you know, initially I thought it was going to be a couple of months, but it, it extended out. So at some level, it did feel a bit irrational. I thought, am I fleeing? What am I fleeing from? But in a sense, I was moving towards something that I've always wanted to do. I've always wanted to live down the coast. I've always been a weekend warrior as a surfer and I love surfing. So, you know, um, it's been amazing coming down here and sort of becoming really intimate with um, with nature and with the surf. I mean, I just have been in the water a lot um, and that's given me a lot of time to think and to pri reprioritize what is important in my life, I think. Um, you know, getting in touch with nature and moving away from the busyness of the city and, and all of that sort of social stuff that I guess has also sustained me in a, in a way but it's nice to have been stiller. Mm. But I was just saying to Lisa before the podcast that it's interesting as, as the world's opening up, I'm starting to feel those, those little desires and those pulls back towards certain things that go on in the city. But it has been really wonderful to be down mm. here. Um, but also at times very isolating. Um, and I think everybody's gone through intense isolation during COVID. Um, but it's sort of been nice to experience that solitude in some ways as well. So there's been benefits as, as well as things that have been really confronting, to be honest. I'm yeah. curious, Damien, because, I mean, we've all sort of been, you know, locked into whoever we're living with and mm. relationships and so forth. Um, but for a lot of us, COVID has meant being separated from our, you know, families, our parents and so forth. So what has it been like to actually be so close to your family for that period of time, which is unusual for it's, you? It's been really, city? it's been really wonderful to be close to the family because, you know, they're, I've always had a really close relationship with my immediate family and also, you know, my extended family, my cousins who all live down here with their families, with their kids. Um, but the time I've spent with them has always been sporadic because I live in the city and they're down here. So it's been, it's been quite, quite amazing to spend that, that time, but it wasn't without its fears, to be honest. And there was, there was, you know, all of us were feeling a little bit fearful and initially, you know, I, obviously we were under the same sort of restrictions for a period of time. So I wasn't just wandering into people's houses and things, you know, my cousin lives 20 doors from here. And we're really close. He's got three kids or four kids, actually. Um, and we, you know, but I, I would go and stand on the front lawn and talk to them from there. Um, and, so and, you know, nice. 
it, 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 as things started to open up and we were allowed into each other's houses a little bit, uh, you know, I was still opening doors with elbows and <laughs> not touching anything the kids might touch in case I get them sick or, you know, even though there was not, no cases down here, there was this still this sense. So that was interesting to go through it with family. But in another sense, you know, seeing my parents so much has been fantastic and, and walking on the beach with them walking with my dad on the beach or my mum on the beach. And, you know, at one point it was only allowed that we were allowed to be with one at a time. Mum would stand in the distance and go like that. And, and it sort of seemed really bizarre. And I know we've all been through things like this. And so, you know, but it still had, it still had its, um, its bizarre side to it. But it has been really nice to, to sort of spend more time with my parents um, because they're in their 70s now and they're still so active. It's incredible that they're so active at the age that they are. And they actually... They actually inspire me. They've really, I've, I've noticed how incredible they are with just sitting with their experience of the day, with nature, with whatever art they're doing, whatever music they're playing. And um, mum, mum has always really, really loved going to the city to see theatre and galleries and stuff. But I think once she sort of came to terms with that, she said out that their life hasn't changed that much. And they've been very engaged and a real lesson to me, to be honest, because there's been times where I've been extremely frustrated um, and they've had to deal with my frustration of feeling hemmed in. But, you know, even just observing the way that they are in the world has been really quite incredible. Yeah, I think that, you know, I obviously haven't been through a very similar experience as you both because being in Sydney, we were only really locked down for a short period of time. It was only about mm-hmm. three months and um, and we never experienced the, the five kilometre radiuses or the uh, 8 p.m. curfews or any of that sort of stuff. So this is like really mind blowing for me because mm-hmm. obviously this has been your reality for months and months on end while I haven't really experienced anything like that. But I do think that um, COVID has this really interesting element in terms of it creates a sense of uncertainty. Mm-hmm. And, you know, our like everyday lives are, um, even though they're not certain per se, we feel like they're certain because we go through these routine activities. We feel like and we've got control. Control. Over, control. Exactly. We've yeah. Lost in a way. Yeah. But, yeah. So it's created this sense of uncertainty for people, which is actually very real on a day to day basis anyway, but we don't usually experience it. Mm. So I think that's like a a critical sort of shift. But um, look, I mean, this is a little bit off topic, but still still there. Look, um, in terms of, you know, when we first went into COVID, there was this massive spike in dating app usage. Um, (laughs) Nice segue. (laughs) Nice segue. I love the segue, Lisa. This podcast rocks. (laughs) From COVID to election to dating apps. Dating apps. (laughs) It was was the best one I could come up with. This is the fun and the flow, though. This is it. We're we're in it now. This is the fun and the flow of relationship, right? That's right. I love it. So, yeah, there there was this huge spike in dating app usage because I think that people were obviously looking to lock someone down for for lockdown, right? <laughs> um, but there's, there's other elements to it too. Like, you know, in a, in a period of uncertainty, we do mm. seek, you know, we do seek um, those traditional structures or those master, pl- those master plots in the background. And so, yeah, so we were all wondering, you know, what has your dating app usage been during <laughs> this time? And um, if it's been non-existent, um, what's been your previous usage and what do you think of dating apps dating apps for me it's an interesting relationship that i have with those because it is an interesting thing and i just say this straight out because because in a sense i guess what's the best word i don't know there's never a good word to to say but because because i have a profile i guess or a public profile Mm. it always feels a little bit strange to be a dating app because um i'm not saying that everybody or nearly you know, nearly everybody or anything would know, but it just, it feels like, you know, if you pop up, there's a possibility that people know straight away who you, who you are or who they think you are is the, mm. is the issue. Um, and yeah, there was a period there where I really resisted getting on any of those dating apps at all because of that. And then as it became more just a world thing, because initially it started out as a little bit of a niche thing and then it sort yeah. of exploded, but it was still niche in some sense. Now it's just the way people date. And actually, just let me say this, that when I was in Sydney about three years ago, I was walking through Darlinghurst and I walked past this this awesome little bar 
on uh, Crown Street. And out the front, it was raining, it was cold, and it said, come inside, warm food and 3D Tinder. In other words, come to the bar and fucking talk to somebody. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like yeah. we'd gotten to this Great. point where it was like, oh my God, we're all on dating apps and nobody's actually talking to each other. And it's remember mm. stepping up to someone and having the, you know, having that sort of dilemma. Do I say hi? Do I not? You know, sometimes you're just confident enough to, other times you're really nervous. It's, it's an interesting thing. Whereas with dating apps, there's this one step, well, more than one step, but a major step of removal. Mm. And the swiping, the swiping thing never really felt feels right to me or felt right to me um it just sort of feels a bit sort of disconnected obviously um having said that though it's interesting because i have a number of friends who've gotten to really deep long-term and committed relationships through dating apps and through you know dating apps such as tinder or hinge or or whatever not even going further into the ones that you pay for and there's all of that going on um yeah i will say straight off the bat as well that I've never been on a date from a dating app. It just has never felt, it just hasn't ever really felt like the way that I, that I engage with, with dating. I, I feel like for me, I'm the sort of person who's got to meet someone uh, to, to get that sort of sense of whether I want to go on a date or not. And maybe that's closed minded, but it, it, it doesn't feel like I'm closing myself off from it. It just doesn't feel like the natural inclination in me to move towards that. Mm. Um, but I have, you know, there's been a couple of times that I've met people on social media, like if it's been Instagram or, or Facebook, it hasn't happened that often, but maybe three or four times I've ended up, you know, some sort of talking to someone through one of those. And it's interesting because the agenda is not initially there as a dating app, but then it's like you meet and you start talking and then, you know, I've, I've ended up sort of going out with a couple of people based on that. Mm. So mm. I don't know if that's just a subversion of... <laughs> no, um, no that, makes you know. complete, that makes complete sense. I think one of the things that people fundamentally um, object to in terms of dating apps is that they are so premeditated. Mm -hmm. So the intent, there is an intent in terms of, you know, you're, you're on there to meet someone. And yeah. one of the, you know, yeah. key ideas around romance is that you, it happens organically. Yeah. So there, it sort of disrupts that idea in, in, in a way that's uncomfortable for people. Mm. Um, but uh, I, moving on to my second fantastic segue, <laughs> I'm, just, I'm, just, I'm, I'm wondering if you've sort of reflected on intimacy and relationships during this period of time alone there. Um, and if so, how? Yeah, I have. I've definitely reflected on intimacy and relationships for sure. And, you know, there are times like anybody, I think, when you're alone and I have been on my own, you know, in terms of not being in, 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 in an intimate relationship or dating during this time, um, the last six months. Mm. And um, in some ways, in some ways, that's been really, really powerful. Um, I think, you know, I sort of said it earlier to Ruth, but it's like... <laughs> it's a funny word to use in terms of nature, but the intimacy that I've discovered with nature and with myself in terms of just being in that solitude space and sitting quietly or walking in, in the bush, you know, there's, there's amazing rainforest out the back here, which has been pretty incredible, but even just all around me, there's a lot of trees and um, it's a beautiful town where I am. Um, and then the intimacy of being in the ocean, like I can't even begin to explain how that fills people up and I don't mean just myself I mean there's documentary after documentary after fucking mm. documentary on on Netflix and all sorts of different platforms about surfing and what it mm. does for people and there's actually there's quite an amazing one it's only half an hour long which someone told me about um, called resurface which is actually about um, veterans coming back in America veterans coming back from Iraq and you know there's a really high really really high suicide rate of of veterans coming back from being overseas on tour and this documentary is about this guy who set up this thing to take them surfing and the the absolute um, discovery of something new and something really revelatory in the water and, and, and surfing completely flips these guys. And, and these are people who've lost limbs and, and also psychologically really damaged to the point where the few people I know who've seen the doco, myself included, I burst into tears three times during the documentary. It's just, it's so, so powerful. And of course I have a connection to the ocean, um, but I just feel that I can be, I can be feeling, say it's lone, let's say it's loneliness because we're talking about intimacy in, in relationship space. 
if I go out for a surf, it completely disappears. If I'm out there in the waves and I'm surfing and I'm having a great time, the endorphin rush, the oxytocin, I'm sure it's oxytocin. It doesn't feel like something just sort of temporary. There's actually a love affair that you build with the ocean and surfers talk about it, you know, and there's, there's all these, you know, all these different people that you meet out in the water as well. There's conversations that you have. And um, mm. interestingly enough, just recently, I had this really incredible encounter with a group of us in the water and a dolphin, a single dolphin that came along and he was playing with the surfers, he or she, I don't know if it was a male or a female dolphin, but was playing with the surfers singly without the pod anywhere in, in sight for at least three hours. And so coming up so close, like it was literally coming right up to my hand and um, literally came at my hand a couple of times and, and I sort of jumped. I didn't, I wish I hadn't have, but you know, it was turning over and just staying for two, three minutes at a time, turning over and looking at me with this little side eye. Mm. And then as soon as a set would come, we'd go to paddle and it, it would just surf underneath us. It was incredible. And then turn around. Now I've seen that before in pods of dolphins, but never for more than 10 minutes, 15 minutes. This dolphin was on its own and was really into human contact and was picking one person at a time and spent like 15, 20 minutes solidly with me and went off and spent time with someone else in the pack. And I ended up, I ended up ringing a, um, a friend of mine who knows this marine biologist and I, I rang the marine biologist to speak to him about it because it was so prof I found it so profound that it was one mm. single dolphin. And he said that that was super fucking rare and he works in the field. He's working in the field all the time. And he just said, that's one of the most rare. And he wrote it to me the next day. He said, Damien, really, that's a magical experience. That's very lucky. It just, the fact that it was a single dolphin. And I said, do you think it's lost its pod? He said, no, I think it just, it, its pod will probably come, which is funny because it did in the next few days and, and then it was gone. Um, but he said somewhere it's had some contact with humans and enjoyed it. And mm. that's what's going on. And mm. I don't know how you replace an experience like that in terms of, of as I said, the, the endorphins that, that roll after having that sort of experience that you don't expect. Mm. Um, now, I know I've drifted off, you know, away from relationship in mm. terms of, of, you know, just intimacy with, with one other person and relationship. Sure, there's a part of me that craves that always. Um, it comes and goes, obviously, but I've found through this time that because of all the rest of that, I think that has quietened down quite a lot because I'm being fulfilled in other ways. Mm. Um, Do you think it, it sounds also a lot, you know, surfing and just connecting with nature, it's really about being in the moment, isn't yeah. it? It's, yeah, taking you out of your head and, you know, all the things you've got to do. And I think COVID has also forced us to do that, to just be in the moment because we can't control the future. Anymore. Yeah, I think that's a brilliant observation. I think that's so true, mm. Ruth, because, and that's exactly what it is. You've just made me really think about that that's so true because it is it's about being in the moment and i think relationships intimate relationships are one element that is really beautiful for that is that we open up into into the moment with somebody else and nothing else exists yeah. you're just in that moment and whether that's in the honeymoon phase or whether that's later as the love deepens and you move through phases there's sure there's arguments and there's there's mm. disparities and there's all sorts of stuff that goes on in our lives but just a hug from someone when you open up past an argument or something like that how much does it bring us into the moment, into our hearts? And um, I think that's something mm. that um, when I've been alone in the past, I've resisted instead of dropping into whatever's happening in the moment. And yeah, so that's definitely what happens with surfing and with nature, without mm. a doubt. And acting, mm. isn't it? I mean, that's that mm. goes to the heart of acting as well. It's about being present in the moment and being true to that. Absolutely. And, and my greatest teachers along the way, and, and, and some of those teachers in the acting field have been the, the other actors that I've worked with, or directors that I've worked with, or directors of photography that I've worked with. Funnily enough, I really enjoy the relationship with the DOP, the director of photography, quite often on a set, they will be the person that will just look across from the camera and just give you a certain look or a wink or something to say, move into your light or, you know, or, or you just need to just be a bit less animated or whatever. And it can be with a slight hand gesture or a, and I love that. I really love that relationship. I actually, funnily enough, I have that relationship with a, a director of photography that I work with. I, I, the director of photography I work with, Denson Baker, who shoots all the films that I write and direct. We have that sort of relationship across the set and this is not in acting capacity for me. This is as a director. And we'll just, we'll both see something at the same time, but he has such an exquisite eye that my view on it, whatever. And then he comes over and goes, but yeah, but what about if we put the camera here and bang, it's on. And then we'll see something else. And in a split second, we'll just know between us, there'll just be a look 
on set between us and instantly it's almost this, this knowing smile and we'll just move the camera without even talking. You know what I mean? And that's, that's a dance. And I think mm. there's so yeah. many different relationships in life that can provide that. Um, and that's something I don't think I've fully <laughs> appreciated up until now and that that's there that can be there with someone chatting with someone in the water or whatever it might be you know mm. but yeah Lisa to get back to to your question I yeah I have thought about it and you know I think I'm realizing that there's in terms of a you know a romantic relationship I'm getting a lot closer to knowing what it is that you know that I'd want to open up to and and be engaged in I think there was some time okay. confusion around that and um, I'm not so not so keen to just jump in for, for unless it's I'm really feeling it, you know, mm. unless it's really, really feeling that it's coming from somewhere deeper. Oh, deeper. I don't know. Deeper is a stupid thing to say. Just, I don't know, just coming from somewhere that's truly curious, I think is what I'm saying. Mm. I, I found a few really interesting things in what you were just talking about. Um, uh, I, you know, Ruth, when you said you have to be so present when you're an actor, I found that really interesting because when you're acting, you're obviously portraying someone else. Mm. So like there's a duality there in mm. terms of like you're present, but you're, you're almost you're present being, being someone else, which is a really interesting concept, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. In terms of relationships and intimacies and that sort of stuff. But so, so tell us a bit about, you know, You've reflected on intimacies and relationships during mm. this period of time. Um, what what are you landing on at this moment? And this is ever changing. Mm. What what are you landing on at this moment in terms of your relationship or intimacy belief system? Like, are you thinking there's the one? Are you thinking there's a network of relationships? <laughs> are you thinking that you know nature is is critical? When you say nature is critical, what, can you just clarify what you mean by that? Do, do you mean do you, or is is your is your belief system centered around nature, for example? No, I don't. I don't. I feel like it's opening up to not just one thing, if you know what I mean. And I think yeah. I think I used to have a without knowing it. I don't think it was premeditated, but I think I had a, a specific, mm. you know, sort of thing that I was moving towards. Um, and. People have always asked me, you know, do you want to have kids? Do you want, and, and it's never been a thing where I go, that's something I would plan. I've always had this belief that things organically unfold, but I'm not saying that's the right belief. Yeah. I really mean that. Like potentially, yeah. potentially I'm missing something. And and I really, I'm fucking fascinated by the fact that that, that could actually be the case that for the last almost 50 years, I've completely missed the point. Um, and I, you know, I haven't held down a relationship longer than three and a half years um, and, you know, when I say I haven't held down, it's always a, a dance between two people. But what I'm saying is the longest mm. relationship I've had was three and a half years um, mm. and, you know, two years, a year. So it, it's interesting that I haven't somehow um, prioritised that in some sense, but I'm not sure how I feel about whether that's a thing that you control or not. But what I'm starting to think is that potentially I didn't create the space in my life for that. Um and I've always been quite someone who really, I traveled a lot. I spent most of my 20s traveling the world, some of my 30s, um, just traveling around just for the sake of traveling all through Europe and, and all over the, the world. That was a big thing for me. Um, and I've always really, really enjoyed that aspect of movement and, mm. and change within my external environment. But I think to answer your question, that I'm coming back to a stiller place and I would really like to actually share something with someone um, that's much more deep and intimate and potentially really long-term, you know, and uh, the, the, the drives that I used to have that were maybe, you know, a little bit more short-term seem to be disappearing for me. Uh, as I said before, I don't, I, I feel like I'm more interested in, in exploring something that I really, that my curiosity moves towards. And then I go, wow, I, I actually feel something here and want to explore this and whether that starts with friendship or whatever it might be, rather than that really I've had a number of experiences that were just like instantly I'm in love and mm. there's that whole thing. And maybe that's where, maybe that's where it's. Maybe, um, maybe it shifts. Yeah. Age 
you know, I had remember this conversation I had with the woman who basically had three ex-husbands, one for each decade, and she was going to <laughs> wow. she just met someone new, so she was like, This is gonna be the fourth one. <laughs> it's like maybe wow. that works, you know. It's amazing. We we get locked into yeah. this sort of idea of, you know, marriage for life or finding yeah. the one or whatever it is, but everyone's different and I think it is the, the more conversations we have, Lisa. I think it is important to, to oh, be yeah. open. To open. <laughs> that but to, it, to, it, it's interesting you say that, Ruth, because because I, you know, going back to what you're saying, Lisa, there, there were times in my life where where I felt really despondent because I didn't have a relationship, you know, like, and and mm. I was coveting it so much and desiring it so much, but then I sort of I. I I don't know, maybe it was a couple of years ago. I sort of just one day this this thing came to me. I just thought, have the fucking life you're having rather than the one that you wish you were having. Mm, you know, and all right. of a sudden intimacy became more about, as Ruth said before, about the moment. And I'm not saying it just happened and that's it and it, all of the rest of that went away. But I but I sort of went, why am I fighting what's actually happening? Because I could die tomorrow. Any of us could. You don't fucking know. I could die today. Who knows? Mm. And do I want to die thinking that or do I want to die being in the mo you know being engaged with what mm. I'm doing and that's look fuck that's a question for all of us to be asking all the time but yeah I sort of realized that I was locking myself out of my own experience looking for something so when those questions come up I find them quite interesting because conceptually I go I don't know I'm not I'm actually don't know I don't know mm. I just know that oh, look, I'm interested I'm, in, you know. I think that's a very solid answer because, you know, I've done hundreds of interviews with my research into this topic and like lots with Ruth as well. And I, I do feel like it is so complicated, you know, mm, it is so mm. complicated. And sometimes I get to the point where I go, I just don't know as well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to be expert, Lisa. I don't, I don't, you're going to be, you're going to be well, docking yeah. to me, see soon. I think, so. I, th I think, you know, one of the really important things is acknowledging that we don't know. Like, we yeah. don't always have to be in a space where, you know, we're certain about every single thing. So, mm. um, and our belief systems shift so much. So, one of the things that I found in doing interviews is that people can um, start with start a 60 minute interview with one particular idea and by the end of the interview they're saying something completely something different, different. <laughs> totally <laughs> totally, totally. So shifting all the time right? and and funnily enough you if you interview a person on a different day and you interview yes. me on a different day and I'm in a particularly down mood or something fuck we all go up and down so you know excuse the f words everywhere but yes. it's just part of the <laughs> part of expression I just you know we all go up and down and it's you know there are days <laughs> where I wake up and I'm feeling completely opposite. And I'm like, I just want that. And I, you know, it's all just grasping. And then there are other days where it's just free and open, you know? And so I don't think it's ever a solid state. Um, mm. so <laughs> yeah. I don't think it, I know it's not always a solid state. And that's that insecurity you were talking about before, Lisa. And, yeah. you know, it, it, we accumulate all these things that we think and we, we sort of feel and we believe, but they're accumulations but what's underneath that accumulation? Are we going to base right. our confidence on what we've accumulated or are we going to be open to having that shattered? And, you know, fair enough. We want to hold on to that stuff because it makes us feel secure. But I think it seems to me the more that, that for me anyway, the more that I, I willingly surrender that and just go, okay, I'm not going to be in such resistance, the less I fucking suffer um, mm -hmm. in some sense. Mm -hmm. And right now, yeah, there are parts of me that would love to be in a relationship. Like really, you know, there's sometimes some days that I fantasize about it for sure. And I think about all, you know, and it's, it's more that it's, it really, when I think about it, it really is, it's the affection more than, than anything else, more than the sexuality, more than any other aspect. It's actually just affection and being mm -hmm. connected. Um, and that's probably because at the moment for a lot of us, we've felt really disconnected. And even, even if we're back in the streets and stuff in Victoria, we're still wearing masks. We're still, it just feels like society's being so cautious right now around this virus. And that's fair enough. Totally understood, you know, get all, yeah. but yeah. it doesn't feel natural to us to not, particularly in an Italian family. Mm. I mean, I'm like, you know, we are so affectionate and I'm generally naturally an affectionate person. So I really crave right now. That's what I'm craving more than anything else. Yeah. Mm, okay. Do you think it, when when you were talking as well, I was thinking about the fact that you are also an actor and a storyteller. And mm. I know myself. You know, we as a storyteller, you spend a lot of your life 
in your imagination, you're always thinking about yeah. the films you want to make or whatever the stories you want to tell. So I guess that's part of who we are as well to kind of have that fantasy of, you know, imagining how you're going to meet someone or what they're going to be, or, you know, the playing that out in your mind as well. It's yeah. Of, having a big imagination too. So there's nothing wrong with that. That's no, absolutely. And that, to. and it's, it is a beautiful thing. It's just, it's just for me, I know that sometimes the imagination takes over <laughs> and I'm not present as you said before. And yeah. so, you know, as you so beautifully said, Ruth, it's, it's just like being in the moment is actually an antidote to so many other things <laughs> as you know, everyone from yeah. Eckhart Tolle to the Dalai Lama to everybody talks about all the time. And, you know, <laughs> we're all struggling to, to, be in that state and that's actually the point there is what does yoda say only do there is no try or whatever, mm, <laughs> whatever. Yeah, yeah. it's like i know but it doesn't <laughs> yeah. we've got Jeff. these brains that keep the overworking <laughs> yeah yeah and it might, i mean just to add to that there's actually um uh there's a theorist called derrida who talks about um how love is um very much imagined and he has this theory around wow. It's called hauntology and that love is that a haunting as such so that so many elements of love wow. are actually imagined rather than the physical. Wow. And to some degree, the physical is actually um, creates uh, disjuncture or creates issues while the imagined is obviously the perfect landscape. Right. Did you say the visible different. creates that disjuncture? The, the, no, the, yes, the, the, the physical. physical. Oh, the physical. The physical. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Wow, so, that's really interesting. Anyway. Yeah, it's, so it's uh, one thing that just came into my mind er, that you said earlier, and I'd love to hear Ruth's feelings on this too. But I did just want to jump back to something you said about being a character and this duality of, you yeah. know, of, of sort of what did you see as the duality? It was the fact that you're being yourself, but you're also being a character. Was that correct? The, <laughs> That's yeah. Not, it's yeah. interesting because I, I, a lot of the teachers, what's your feelings around that, Ruth? Like, well, I, for me, it just comes back down to the truth, doesn't it? Because you yeah. can have an experience as that person, but you Beautiful. are physically experiencing that moment and it's about tuning in. And I think, Damien, we've had a lot of conversations about this as well, about, yeah. you know, you teach acting and, yeah. you know, about being in the moment and reacting to what's happening in the moment. And mm. ultimately, that's what the audience tune into. As a director, that's what you're trying to orchestrate to create. Yeah. You have all this unreality to create something really true. There's, there, and there's that really beautiful saying that you would know, Ruth, too. It's a Meisner saying, who was one of the yeah. great teachers, Lisa, in America, um, in the, well, right through the 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, uh, Stanford Meisner, Sanford Meisner. And he said, um, acting is living truthfully under imaginary circumstances. Exactly. That's and so it. the living truthfully part is you showing up almost funnily enough, not almost, but as yourself, like just show up and let the script do the work, let the conflicts in the story do the work because whoever, you know, have any of us in our lifetime read a novel, is there anyone that has read a novel and not been moved to some degree and, and maybe even been moved to tears, but there's no actors involved. It's just mm -hmm. the words on the page that get you know the story going in your own psyche and that can create emotion so in some ways the more as david mamet says another great playwright and teacher the more you step out of the way as an actor and get out of your own way and you, you more yourself and just serve the truth of whatever the script is saying in the moment then the more the audience will lean in to to be engaged with you so so that duality collapses because it's really just it's beautiful how ruth said it it's just the truth you're just telling the truth mm -hmm. right there in that moment to the other actor that you're working with and it's always the, the the other actor is is where the power of your performance is as a really really beautiful coach who who's teaching still now in his 80s i think now um larry moss who who's actually taught leonardo dicaprio and other people but he also worked with with um as, as an actor he worked with people like marlon brando back in the 50s and 60s and he you know he always says you it, it, when you're working with another actor you're reading the weather and then trying to change it <laughs> And then he says, good luck, good luck trying to change the weather, but they're trying to do the same to you. And so that's where the conflict comes. And that's where the emotion in a scene comes from. And if you let the script tell us that you're a doctor or a lawyer, because how many different types of doctors and lawyers are there? If, if you let the script tell us that this is the relationship and that it's violent and whatever else, or it's beautiful or it's tender, or it's let that un yeah. unfold. And that's, that's where, that's where I think that duality collapses because you just show up as much as yeah. you can. So it is about being present in a sense. 
Mm. Secrets and tricks. That's (laughs) it's fascinating stuff, and I feel like I could drop into a complete hole around this. And as Ruth knows, I can really drop into like you know these mental holes. (laughs) (laughs) um, Welcome to humanity. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) The other part to this, but then I will get to my to my actual questions because the other part to this is that the real self doesn't really exist as well, right? Mm. The real self is an accumulation of, you know, different social imprints and cultural imprints and all that sort of stuff. And so it's all, it's all really performance. Yeah, you know, it's really, it, 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 I find this stuff, Lisa, it's Unraveled. really funny. I find this stuff really fascinating. You know, like uh, I read a lot about the, you know, this sort of stuff about the self and consciousness theory. Mm. So I just find it fascinating. I, I find it really interesting. Mm. That's my particular bent. You know, I'd rather be doing that than, mm. than trivia doesn't, you know, it, it, it's like, for me, it's, but it's interesting. I was watching this talk with a, a teacher called Ajashanti the other day, um, just on YouTube, a 10 minute thing. And this guy said, there is no self, you know, which is sort of what Ajashanti is teaching. But the guy was so sure of himself. There was sort of this surety around it that was sort yeah. of a bit more egoic or something. I don't know. And Ajashanti yeah. said, yeah, yeah, really? Do you think you're getting out of here alive? <laughs> <laughs> and the guy, you saw the guy's Adam's apple move like, oh. And he was like, he's like, you know, because, and then Ajashanti said to him, you know, like, because we're talking, I'm talking in the relative now and you tell me there is no self, but when I say that fear comes into your eyes. So what are you relating to? Like, don't be so quick to say one or the other. It's both. There's, you know, because the day to day is also fucking stunning and beautiful, you know, um, and this madness that we sort of, we live in. Um, and I could go down this, I could go down this (laughs) hours as well, but no, I just think it's worth, it's worth bringing that up Lisa though I, I like that you bring that up because and I think we we do tend to um, dissolve something in us dissolves when we meet somebody else particularly initially you know if we fall in love it's like it's just like we're suddenly in that bubble and anyone who's mm. had that experience it's like you, you do feel like you've merged mm. you know okay so and to get to, to some different topics around masculinity yeah. um so you know it's a highly contested space what are your thoughts around contemporary masculinity and and what it means <laughs> so funny i sigh no the, the reason that that sigh comes out is mm. really because again there's something there's something that i feel is obviously really you know effective and, and important about going into definitions or ideas or thoughts around these sorts of things. But I really, I just have this sense that the people that I find the most um, affecting and charismatic in my life, whether they be man, woman, non-gender, non-binary, whatever, whatever it it, it might be, are the people who show up in their truth and their authenticity Mm. Mm. as much as possible. I mean, I I don't know if there's a, you know, I, I don't, I think there's some perfected thing, but I guess what I'm saying is that people who are forthright and are willing to speak their truth, whatever the fuck their truth is in that moment, if it's connected to what they fully, fully feel, and they're willing to put that out there and willing to have it challenged and maybe learn something through that experience as well, because that's the other side of it. But people who really show up and then people who have a natural inclination of care for other people, it's not just about themselves. And I think, you know, we live in such a self oriented society particularly you know i mean i sound like i'm you know it's something we've heard thousands of times but social Mm. media and all these things there is this sort of sense of of the me generation um obviously and and i think real masculinity is is the same as real femininity or real or real any entity i just think it's showing up and being really authentically available even if that's being even if that on the other extreme is being slightly blocked, but being open enough to say, I, I, I'm, I'm feeling blocked or I, I don't, you know, when people can, can expose a little bit more of themselves and be vulnerable enough to actually say, hey, I feel vulnerable, but I don't feel, you know, and the shame I feel around that I'm not buying into. I'm like, you know, there's, there's vulnerability here, but Patty Smith, this is interesting. And I'm talking about, a, you know, a really incredible woman, the godmother of punk. But Patty Smith, who's now 73, she's got this beautiful quote. And I don't know at what point in her life she came up with this quote, but you know, she's a she's a Pulitzer Prize 
book winner, you know, mm. as well as an incredible singer and all of those things and a poet. And, you know, when, when they, when they announced the Nobel prize for Bob Dylan, she went to pick it up because Bob Dylan didn't want to go and pick it up. And she's got this beautiful quote where she says, I'm going to promote myself. I'm going to promote myself exactly as I am with all my weak points and all of my strong ones. My mm. weak points are that I'm self-conscious and often insecure. And my strong point is that I don't feel any shame about it. And if you watch Patti Smith in interviews and things like that, she's often quite, um, you know, she seems like she's, she's uh, there's, there's a lot of anxiety going on and there's, there's a lot of vulnerability there, but that's what's charismatic about her. And yeah. so when that shows up in a human being, that, that to me is, is the real, the real center of, of, of meeting somebody. And I think to me, that's what masculinity is. If, it, if it's anything yeah. it's going up and, and it, it's not this, it's obviously not this external idea of tough or, or whatever. And I used to think it was that to a big degree, you know, and I, I always felt that I didn't have it when I was younger. I was a really timid kid. I was a hugely timid kid really, really afraid of, of engaging in contact sports. And I hated myself for it. Like really deeply was re really down on myself because I couldn't break through that sort of thing. And then I found drama through, you know, my mother's an actress, but I found acting and that was where mm. I was able to sort of find something that I felt like, oh, wow, I can really connect and, and do this in a way that feels like it's, it's giving and I'm connecting. And I also feel really good in myself doing it but it was never competitive. It was always connected. Whereas those competitive sports actually physically scared me. And it wasn't till years later that I started to, to get more of a sense of, of feeling uh, comfortable in that contact. Um, and the surf's taught me a lot about that because, you know, the surf can get big and get fucking scary, <laughs> really scary. Mm. And I, I had terror around surfing for a long time because even though I'm a good swimmer, so it's, it's, it's learning those sorts of things. And so I think, that's allowed me to to find a bit more of a synthesis between those two parts of myself and maybe that's part of what masculinity is as well is standing in that fear and going okay i'm fearful but i'm going to give it a shot anyway um mm. i don't know does that make sense maybe i'll ramble then, i don't know i totally think it makes sense i'm and i'm curious to know and this is this is sort of an interesting question. Like, what does what does being a man look like in twenty twenty? Like, you often you often hear people talking about you know that there are no role models anymore, or there's you know not a set understanding of being a man, and that can be tricky. But does that need to do, do that? Do those things need to exist, or do they do they need to be specifically male or man? I don't such? think they have to be specifically that at all mm. i think you're you're born into what you experience and if that's non-binary or or if that's mm. you know whatever whatever gender specificity we put on that we're born into our own expression and you know it was funny when you when you actually said what is it to be a man or right, i'm going to talk about something very close to me and that is acting mm. and mm. the men who i feel it rushing through my body now i feel such a sense of of gratitude for for the men i've met in this career like um, you know, Brian Brown, such an incredible human being, so much humanity, so much humility, and so, so much, uh, <laughs> so much humor. Um, and Sam Neill, and the two of them are friends. I worked with them on a series. I was lucky enough, you know, I felt so blessed to work with the two of them on a series called Old School. And they were just funny. They showed up. They were so kind to other people. And if anybody's been watching Sam Neill's Instagram during this whole time of COVID, mm -hmm. every day, he gets on and I think he's, I think the first thing he says is something like, how are you doing? I think that's, that's how he starts it or how are you going or something like that. And it just a couple of times made me want to weep because he's literally tuning in and he's mm. so, he's so willing to, to just throw himself out there for the benefit of others because he really feels like he has something to offer in that sense. David Golpalil is another one who I worked with, you know, I, I, I very, you know, I mean, it's probably the most magnificent experience of my life was was getting to work with David and direct him in a film that I'd written out in the Kimberley out on on country you know and spending this time with David was just exquisite and David's had such a big life and so much has happened in his life and so much stuff that that is wonderful and then other things that that he didn't feel was so wonderful but he's actually moved through them and he's grown and he's taken responsibility for those things and then you meet him and there's this incredible gentility but underneath or not underneath but along with that is this incredible fierceness at the same time and being with David is almost for me it was almost like being with the weather so 
so changeable in the moment, here in the moment and authentic, but never apologizing for any of, of it. You know, it, it, it's just like right there, but also really wanting to include others. And I think that's what masculinity, true masculinity mm. for me is about that. It's about including other people and about fighting for principles, not even fighting for it, standing for principles, whatever the words are, standing for principles that are beyond your own fucking mm. selfish needs. And it's taken me a really fucking long time and still going through, you know, all of that stuff myself for sure. So those men in my life, those elder statesmen of my, my career, in my career space have really touched my life in that, in that way. And um, I'm deeply grateful for that, for those men. Hugo Weaving's another one, you know, like just really, mm. really generous human beings. And that's, we're talking, I mean, there's many women in this space too. So many women in this space. And you've asked me about masculine, but many women in this space as well. And uh, quite often a lot of the sort of older women that I've met who just blow my mind. Yeah. Beautiful. Mm. Beautiful. And uh, yeah, you, I'm sure you're a role model to many as well, Damien. <laughs> I don't, it's, it's interesting. You know, when I, when I'm teaching, I always say to the students, and this is really, really something that so, someone, a very good, very, well, I would say a, a very close friend of mine, but somebody who I sort of worked with a bit professionally said to me once was, he just said, you know, it, it's, it's all about collaboration. And even though I already knew that, this was many years ago, I just got it. I just sort of got it. And he was talking about it in a directive, in a directorial space. When you're directing, it's about collaborating with your crew and collaborating with everyone who's in that job. And I always knew that, but it was really nice to have it centered. And when I speak to my students, I always say, this is a collaborative experience. I don't know what a teacher is in an art form. How the fuck do you teach <laughs> an art form as abstract as acting? So this is sort of a space for facilitating, co-facilitating. We're all working together. And of course, as the teacher, you're bringing certain skills to bear and, and ideas, but you can only offer those, but it's really about those people uncovering their own technique. They've got their own way of working and it's just trying to get rid of some things that are getting in the way perhaps. And I have students who literally blow my mind and I feel mentored at the end of a session because they, they, they just risk themselves at such levels. And if, if we can create a safe enough space all together as a class for people to be able to risk everything that's inside them, um, and even the fear of falling flat on their face and maybe that happens, but that's accepted. I think that's, you know, that's the key. And, um, uh, you know, also encouraging people to move past their own drama and whatever, that's fine. But yeah, I, I think mentorship goes both ways. <laughs> I really do. I really, you know, mm. I, I don't think you're ever truly a mentor to anybody unless you're mentored by their experience as well, because otherwise you're, you're, you're not open to them. I don't know. I don't know. It's maybe it's a strange thought, but I. Yeah, no. I think that's. I mean, the next question I have is really superficial now. <laughs> Can I just say one last thing I'll say though, Lisa, is when you talk about, when you talk about, like when I look at the AFL, for example, and I've never been a, a long-term, you know, rugged fan of the AFL all the time, but believe me. If you, but you do barrack for Collingwood. I do. I barrack for Collingwood. And I was going to say, <laughs> believe me, if you get me in front of a Collingwood game and things are going wrong, I start throwing things and I'm, I don't seem at all <laughs> centered. I get really pissed off and I throw my toys and I seriously throw my toys. I get really... <laughs> It's funny as shit and not funny for the people in the room sometimes. But what I was going to say was, you know, I've also grown and Ruth's going to hate me for this, but I've grown a real love over the last couple of years for Richmond. And part of the reason that that's happened <laughs> is because last year, Richmond um, beat GWS, GWS beat Collingwood the week before. Yes. And I'm going to say it in nasty terms. They, they played some really nasty tactics. Really rough. Really rough that shouldn't be in the game from my point of view. And so when the next week at the grand final last year, when, when Richmond walloped them, I was like, oh my child, I was like screaming. <laughs> but I found out about Richmond in their team culture. You want to talk about masculinity in their team culture, apparently, this is what I've heard apparently. So it's third hand or whatever, but they have, they've had um, psychologists or coaches come in and work with the players. And one of the things that I heard was that they got the players on one particular day or over a couple of days to each get up and tell a story that had really moved them in their lives that was deeply important to them. And apparently for every story, there wasn't a dry eye in the room, basically. And they all, they all shed tears. And can you imagine as you build that intimacy between, between people, men, women, doesn't, you know, doesn't matter. It's like that builds 
a real sense of cohesion and trust and and beyond trust it's just like something where there's a knowing or an understanding i think it's understanding mm-hmm. and then on the on the field then they're just able to actually really play as a team you know and no matter what happens whether they're walloped or whether they win it's sort of like they'll they'll go through that together and i think mm-hmm. it used to be a lot more you know fuck up son do your thing you know that whole thing that we used to have and i've never liked that i've never understood it i've never got it like I understand that I'm ignorant in not understanding other generations in that. So there's an ignorance in saying that, but it's never spoken to me. I've never liked that. And that's what I think I didn't like about contact sports when I was a kid, because I didn't feel supported. It felt like something that was this put on masculinity. It always felt a bit like, you know, let's deepen our voices and talk like this. And I just, I don't, I don't get it. I don't get it. And, and I used to worry about talking about that. I couldn't give a fuck now. I just go, you know, like it just doesn't something about that doesn't feel genuine to me and that's my own shit that's my own judgment my own but I, yeah i just feel like that's what true masculinity is when all of that's allowed the really the really rough stuff as well as the tender like it's got to all be there in a, mm. in a sports sense is what i'm saying you know yeah the yin and the yeah. yang <laughs> um that's great that actually sort of taps into something we were going, going to ask you and i might just quickly throw this out there this is a bit quite superficial but a bit of a fun question that has yeah, we've, sure. it's come up a lot in slow love and um we've asked a lot of women this so we need to throw it out to a fantastic <laughs> perspective sure. um Damien what do you think about this sort of stereotype I guess of the Aussie bloke you know we've looked at <laughs> I think I just said it. <laughs> no, no, you have, you have. But I want to add something to it because you know we've we've joked about the Aussie <coughs> bloke being a romantic dud and and so forth, and this has been come up a lot in Lisa's research. Um, but yeah, I just want I just wonder how you feel about it being half Italian, having an mm. Italian mother. Yeah. Um, whether that has created some kind of conflict in you? Have you tried to? play you know the Aussie bloke in your life growing up or how do you feel about that yeah I don't I wouldn't say that I think I've tried to play the Aussie bloke in terms of thinking of it that way but as Mm. I said earlier I definitely when I was younger that sense of sensitivity or or complete I was born with the most stupid amount of enthusiasm in the world, like ridiculous. Can't keep my mouth shut. Love to talk about everything that's coming into my mind. And and I want to share everything. Look at that sunset. Look at the dolphin. Look at the fucking, you know, and, and literally other kids would just fucking look sideways at me. Like you're weird, dude. And, and I think that that really used to shut me down. And, and so I, I, I did look at, there was a kid, Tim, if Tim, Tim, if you're around, if you remember, <laughs> the, the prep, I can't remember your second name, but he would sit with his legs crossed up straight like this. And he'd sit there and he just seemed to be the model idea of a, a little boy, you know, like, and I was this like sort of kid who almost wore pajamas to school because I was a hippie <laughs> and whatever. And I always felt ineffectual in that sense. I always felt like there was something not quite, you know, and, and really, as I said earlier, so yes, I definitely tried to live up to whatever this idea was that I had of masculinity, it did create conflict. And it wasn't just the Italian side, Ruth. It was also the hippie side. Mm. And as much as my dad hates me saying that we were hippies, we were <laughs> fucking hippies. And, uh, you know, um, and so it was sort of all, f- I don't mean free lovers, <laughs> free lovers <laughs> and everybody was just, but but it was sort of that, that thing of, you know, freedom of mind. And, you know, there might've been a little bit of, you know, weed and then, my, you know, all, all <laughs> other sort of stuff going on and lots of theatre and my mother was in the theatre. So I was really expressive in those ways. And that didn't seem to fit the model of some idea of, of the linear school, you know, and so I don't know if it was the Aussie male thing, but it was definitely a societal thing of feeling like I had to be more masculine, whatever mm. the fuck that meant. And that, that created incredible conflict in my life, like incredible for sure, without a doubt. Um, yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Yeah. Great. And I think, you know, like I, I think it's an interesting question because, you know, um, it has come up a lot in my research in terms of people still talk about the Aussie bloke. And yeah. even, for example, um, queer men will talk about the Aussie bloke and how they're li- trying to live up to some sort of stereotype of the Aussie bloke as well. And, you know, when I, when I first, when I first um, heard this idea of the Aussie bloke, I was like, 
who is this person? Mm -hmm. Like, I, I, I don't understand what exactly it entails. And, you know, it sort of came out that it was this idea of, you know, very white, very heterosexual, very, um, you know, masculine, muscular, mm -hmm. you know, drinks mm -hmm. beer, all of these super stereotypical concepts around mm -hmm. um, what the Aussie bloke was. And to me, it was just completely crazy that this idea was still out there in 2020 and that people were trying to emulate this or invoke these types of masculinities as mm. well so yeah it's a it's, and it's I think, very I curious think, you know i think yeah labels can be an issue i really yeah. think in anything um it's like when i you know i played a character in a film that was addicted to heroin as a big part of his existence and a big part of what we we're exploring in the film but i used to get asked all the time what's it like to play a heroin addict and i used to think mm -hmm. that's such a reductionist question mm. like you know, and I and me being 22 years old and or principal, and oh, you know, but that's reductionist, whatever. But I do feel it. It's like, you know, because because however many people have had that experience of of addiction to whatever, it, it, we're actually exploring that. So this is a person who happens to be addicted to heroin, yes. but you're calling them a heroin addict. Mm. So it, it sort of feels sometimes the same way. And yeah, I you know, I see a certain thing in my head. I mean, I see Paul Hogan with his gut hanging out, holding yeah. an esky, you know, with beer, fucking doing that. That to me is the Aussie bloke, like, you know, like, oh, you know. Um, and he, he was attractive. taking, but he was taking the piss out of it back in the 70s. And yeah, so yeah. nobody's done it as well since. Nobody. And he yeah. did it even better, not even better. Actually, I won't say that, not better, just differently on a bigger scale when he did Crocodile Dundee. Yeah. He took this Aussie bloke to Hollywood, but he made him endearing too, because there's such beauty in it as well. There's such, there's such, you know, like one of my favorite scenes ever is when he goes to this party and this guy, this guy's doing cocaine off the table. I don't know if any of you remember this. And Paul Hogan just goes up and he goes, Oh, you got a bit of a, what's going on, mate? He goes, what's that? He goes, Oh, it's cocaine. He says, what does it do? And he goes, it gives you a bit of a buzz. And he goes, what? Like having a blowfly up, you know, <laughs> he's, like, he's like, listen, mate, I've got a better idea if that's going on for you. And he gets all the cocaine, he gets a hot bowl of water and pours it in the water and gets a tea towel and puts it over the guy's head. <laughs> like when you're steaming, like that old Aussie thing, right. you're steaming yourself. And literally you cut back to this guy at the party two or three times and he's sort of looking up from under the tea towel, not getting a buzz at all. <laughs> I just love, there's something really practical about the Aussie bloke. If you want to go, you know, into yes. that, or the Aussie, that whole thing. And that's, that's a part of our culture that actually, to be honest, I, I really love. There's some part of me that's in mm. love with that practicality <laughs> the charm. And, that, and that sort of, there's a charm there, you know, and um, the sense of, the sense of humor, you know, that can sometimes be there that's so laconic. And, you know, mm. when I worked with David mm. Gopalil, you know, that sense of humour was there in spades, it's just this sort of laconic, dry sense of humour. And I, it just mm. comes through. It's so, it's so wonderful. Um, so I don't know. I think there are, are beautiful sides to it as well. But I think it's that it's, we also equate it with being locked. We equate mm. it with being a bit locked and a bit like... Yeah, quite yeah. right. Anglo-Saxon, a bit repressed. Yeah, and... mouth's locked. Everything's locked, yeah. a bit locked. Bit locked. <laughs> <You know>? <laughs> <Stiff>. <laughs> All right, yeah. kind of taps into the next question. Um, um, we have sort of covered this a little bit, yeah. but I'm just curious about your experience of playing some of these iconic characters that you've played. Like obviously Benji, you know, you were highly acclaimed for that role. Mm. He is a very inf infamous character. Mm. Um, and other characters like Owen in Janet King, who obviously had quite, you know, big egos, yep. toxic elements. And some sexist views. Yeah. So how did you approach that and how did you bring your own sort of sense of vulnerability to those highly sort of egotistical roles? Yeah, it's always interesting. With with um, playing Benji in Underbelly was interesting. <clears throat> and it's, it's always, you know, it, it was something that... I discussed with the director for quite a long time and there was a real sense because there was that line about him he was the most loved murderer in melbourne that was actually from a mm. newspaper article um and i i did some research and met some of his friends and to this day i'll say it you know all of them became emotional talking about him so that mm. that tapped me into something in myself i'm not saying i knew anything but it just made me go oh there's something here that's beyond my idea of who this person might be of course and so I was really interested in exploring that 
and I said to the director, you know, and they'd already written it as if he was living with his parents at home and stuff. So those elements were there. But the director said, what, what's your feeling? And I said, look, I think it'd be, it'd be worth exploring sensitivity in this character. And he looked at me, the producers looked at me as if I'd lost my fucking mind, to be honest. Um, but the director, Peter Androkides, was really into that idea. And he said, yeah, that'll be interesting because we've got 37 male characters all sort of vying in this in this sort of you know in inverted commas masculine space um it'll be interesting so he said that'd be great so you know it'd be interesting to sort of just train the camera on i remember him saying i want to train the camera on you on that basis in a more slow way and sort of and so we just we just played with this idea of stillness and sensitivity and then whatever i the script told me to do whether i'm shooting someone or whatever it might was sort of would come out of the blue um and as I just let go to that, it was really interesting. It just sort of, it just, it was one of the jobs, I must say, really honestly, it was one of the jobs that I had the most, the most uh, satisfying experience doing because something happened where I just, I just wasn't, once I'd prepared, I was just sort of free in the role. And uh, mm. I, I heard Matthew McConaughey saying the other day, something that I've been saying to my students, which is you've got to prepare to have your freedom. I only heard this like four days ago, but that's always been my experience and I never put it into those sort of words. So thank you, Matthew McConaughey. Because mm -hmm. So I would prepare within an inch of my life. I knew the script really well and just go in and just play with the other guys. And, and we were lucky. The cast were all really so collaborative. Everybody, there were no real fucking egos on that, on that, you know, on that show. And that, that was from director producers through the actors, through everybody. And so th there was a really collaborative experience. And so those elements just came out of the script, as I said earlier. So those sort of, you know, whatever those, those elements of the actual character were in the story. Um, yeah. And, it, you know, obviously, yeah, there was, there was a really deep level of, of wanting to honor humanity in the role because it's a true story. It's not just something that unfolded that, you know, and when I say true, true to there's a story on the street and of course embellished for television and all of those sorts of things, but there's an element to it where there's a, there's got to be a certain amount of respect for the fact that it, it really went down. People really lost their lives. And no matter how you feel about whatever those elements might be, these are human beings. And that's yeah. what I loved about that. And that came down from the director. It really did. It came up from mm. Peter Androchetti's as a setup director um, and the writers very much so and the producers. So that was a really supported experience in that way. Um, and then when I, when I was playing Owen, <laughs> Peter was another, he was a director on that as well, one of them. But when I was playing Owen, it was funny. Owen was this, you know, he's the head of the Department of Public Prosecutions and, and um, comes in as this sort of silk and this lawyer who wants that position initially and just arrogance and it was written into the role mm. and I just I don't know what happened I just enjoyed I just went fuck it I'm just <laughs> gonna play arrogant this is fun but in that arrogance still staying really connected with the actors that I was working with and working on principles it's sort of funny sometimes you use principles that maybe are not arrogance but they have something to do with confidence but that juxtaposed with the script becomes arrogance or or you know, and some parts of watching Owen back, I, I think to myself, what a fucking creep. <laughs> <laughs> like, but it wasn't like I was trying to play a creep, but because of his behavior in the script, there's no way you can get away from that. Um, and then Bikey Wars, for example, you know, I remember talking to mum because I, I was sort of saying, oh, it's interesting trying to find the heart of who this character is. Because with Benji, I'd really gone deep and looked into, she said, well, maybe he just drinks beer and eats hamburgers. <laughs> And something in that clicked for me. And I just went, she said, maybe it's all just base because I had to do a lot of fight scenes and stuff like that. And because as I said to you, I'm, I'm afraid of conflict. And actually this is interesting because I was, I was doing a scene with a really beautiful actor called Richard Cawthorn. And um, we had to do a fight scene in front of all these other blokes and we were all, you know, and the two of us had to go each other and, you know, it had been choreographed to a certain degree, but we sort of had to make it look as real as possible. And I was re still really timid of, of that sort of physical contact so i just found this part of me that was a bit cheeky and even though inside my heart was beating and i'm going oh i'm gonna get smacked here or whatever <laughs> and i feel a bit like you know back in the schoolyard when i but i just did something with it and started dancing around and turned that into a cheekiness on the day it just came to me because i was and i let myself be exposed in that whoa fucking check you out like but just sort of came back at it um and then I don't know, that just sort of unlocked something else. And so for the rest of the thing, that character became a real smart ass. Like, yeah. So different characters bring different things out in you, I think. Um, 
but there's always an element of yourself in it. Mm. I think, and and I think one of the most important things, obviously, and many actors have said this over the years and directors, is that you can't judge. You can't judge if you judge your character, you're stuffed. Mm. Yeah. You, 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 if you sit in judgment, you're in a real. The same wandering. thing as a writer too. Yeah. Isn't it? I mean, there's a lot of similarities with writing and acting. But Absolutely. yeah, you can't judge your character. You've got to. Yeah. Be, let them be. <laughs> yeah, let them be what they are. That's that's yeah. what's happening, and they have all their own struggles and all their own things going on. But if you sort of go, oh, you're a heroin addict, or you're this, or as I said mm. before, all of a sudden you cut yourself off from the humanity, and well, then what's to risk? Who cares if there's no vulnerability in the character? Or no, or, or no covering that you're seeing little cracks in, then you're not going to care. If it's just the covering, you won't mm-hmm. care. You've judged it and you've gone, you know, I'm not going to go that deep into it. I just think that kills, it. kills the work, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Super interesting stuff. Um, so obviously, like, you know, with this concept around masculinity, uh, you know, often the idea around mental health, and around talking about mental health is not part of this, you know, very um, strict and firm idea of what masculine is. And mm. we were curious to find out a bit more about your journey mm. with mental health. Mm. And, mm. you know, it's so important sharing that um, yeah. because, you know, it helps other people share too. It is important sharing it. And it's always interesting, you know, as soon as you mention it, it, it always brings up this two things. It's like a sense of, oh, this is a taboo subject to talk about. Mm. But then I realised that, feeling in me is also about self-protection so it's 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 but then i've what i've come to understand about it is that the more it's spoken about um the more it's shared and the more it's shared and uh you know normalized not normalized what's normal anyway who fucking Mm. knows and Mm. you know i I will preface everything by saying i was lucky enough to study one year of a of a a counseling course which was called transpersonal counseling but it was talking about the fact that rather than labeling people you deal with whatever's comes into the room and just as much as possible put your judgment aside and say this is what this person is showing up you know whether they're seeing if they're seeing green aliens that's their experience that is their experience so let's start there rather than trying to say well that's not what's happening start with that and then explore it and what what's happening within that that's you know that's a that was sort of a metaphor used for that so but yeah my own experience was um yeah in my teen years i suddenly just sort of started experiencing a lot of anxiety um, and and panic attacks, uh, which then sort of I guess if we're if we're working in the medical model, um, and you know that that there are real benefits to that model um, and some drawbacks I think, but um, yeah, I that then moved into depression. So it was anxiety and depression, and it would swing between the two, and it was quite vicious through my late teens and early twenties, mid twenties. For, for quite a few years, I really struggled and I saw psychologists um, and I was lucky enough to, to find a couple of psychologists in my life during that time that were really supportive and were also, um, interestingly enough, just not interested in going down the road of, of medication. Um, they just were like, you know, you seem curious enough to want to explore this. So if you can hang in there and breathe through it and, and learn about breathing and learn about, you know, uh, self-exploration, just working out what it is that's creating these, these anxieties in mm. you. Um, and I found that, I found that highly, highly effective, um, really important, but it didn't, it wasn't like it just evaporated overnight either, but knowing that I had someone that I could go and see weekly or, you know, every couple of weeks or whatever, if I needed it, was really important having that support and and feeling that it was okay to reach out and I never had that issue with reaching out like I think because I come from an Italian family maybe maybe that's maybe that's a stupid thing to say but I do feel like it was it was it wasn't looked down upon it was like okay if that's what you need to do I just felt it I felt like I want to reach out and talk to a mentor and I feel like I just didn't didn't feel like there were direct mentors around me who understood that psychological stuff that, that I was going through. Um, even though there were some beautiful men around, I, I just, I was more interested in finding out exactly why I was feeling so, so bad. Mm. So it was anxiety and depression and really the, the, the um, panic attacks got really quite vicious, quite, quite bad. I'd have full panic attacks in trains and all in all sorts of places. I'd run out of restaurants. I'd just leave. I'd get up and leave a, a dinner table. Um, and people would 
really close friends of mine knew what was going on and they'd chase me down the street and calm me down and stuff. I look back and it just seems crazy now because it's so distant, but all through my life, there's been, there's been a little bit of a, there's sometimes um, remnants of that come up for me. And I think some of it goes back to what we were talking about earlier. Not all of it. I think there's many different reasons that these things come into our life, but some of it comes back to a resistance of, of my own sensitivity um, to my own sensitivity because I didn't feel like it was being supported in a certain quarter of my life, which was school and other, you know, more practical parts of my life. Sure. It was, it was okay amongst my friends and, and at home with family, but then out in the world, I did feel like I needed to live up to something else. And I think I wasn't living, I wasn't sure how to, how to integrate those two things. Mm. And I think that's for a lot of people. That's where, where feelings of isolation come in and anxiety and social anxiety. I had intense social anxiety and you would never think it because I'm stupidly gregarious, but um, really there was a really shy side of me um, that would sit crippled in a room, but try and show that I was feeling okay. And that was not a good way to be because I'm trying to project something there to cover up the fact that I felt so vulnerable. So I think mental health is a really, really important thing because um, there is help out there. There are people who are amazing and who can really help you to, if you want to go down that road, yeah. find a, a much more easy way to be in the world. Um, or, you know, and I think it's a life process. I don't know. I don't think this, this, this is a quick fix ever. But I, for a long time, I had a real, a real hell bent thing against medication. I don't feel that anymore in terms of what medication is, but I, but I think what it was, was it was just like thinking, how can you feel the way that I was feeling and go to, to just to a GP or whatever, and just be given Zoloft or just be given to me, that's not a duty of care to anybody because that's a band aid. But those things are really important. If someone's deeply depressed, of course, that's that's the case. And some people need to live on those sorts of things their whole lives. But I think it needs to also, this is just my own personal feelings about it, but I think it also mm -hmm. needs to be dealt with through communication and mm -hmm. through support, not just the medication itself, you know? Um, and that's, that's definitely the way I, I view it now. Um, mm -hmm. But I just feel that I was very lucky to meet a couple of psychologists uh, and mentors who who helped me through without needing to go there. But I've never ruled it out. I've always gone, well, you know, if, if that became the case, then, you know, that's, that's what it is. Mm. Really powerful stuff. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, but Can I just say, it's funny, one of, my, one of my mentors said this thing to me and I just want to, I do want to share it. He said, and I think this is really true. He's a yoga teacher. He's a really fantastic, Michael de Manincor is his name. And He's a yoga teacher, but also a, a psychologist and a therapist. And one day we were talking in a session and I was, I was going through some real depression that had come up back up in my life in my late thirties. And I was seeing him and he said to me, Damien, I'm not a magician and this is not magic. <laughs> I'm a mechanic and this is mechanics. And yeah. we're teaching you to become your own mechanic. And if you walk out of this relationship, relying on me to be your mechanic more than yourself, then we failed. Mm. Um, and he meant that he was talking about all the psychological elements, including the yoga itself and learning how to, you know, this is your energy and maybe you need to swim at this time or you need to expend some energy in that way or this is when you need to sit and you can experiment with these things mm. and yoga will help and these things will help. And it's never just one thing. Mm. For him, sometimes yoga, if you couldn't, if you couldn't, you know, get out of bed to do your asana and all that sort of stuff, you just say, go for a fucking walk, go surfing, whatever it might be, that is your physical practice for the day. And your, your meditative practice might be just sitting still, you know, at home on the couch, eating a piece of fruit toast, half eaten piece of fruit. <laughs> it doesn't necessarily have to be sitting in meditation, you know, bombing, yeah. but it can be that too. Um, and I think mental health and, and spiritual is such a big overused word, but mental health and some sort of practice that, that moves into mindfulness or, or something like that can be highly, 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 highly beneficial. Mm. we don't talk about it enough mm. completely agree mm. it goes back to nature too but mm. i guess we should we should wrap up all like yes yeah, final question lisa so to wrap up and i guess I, I you know how i talked about how you know when you chat to someone for 60 minutes you they can start off with one opinion and then at the end they can shift almost completely yeah. so yeah, yeah. i guess everyone <laughs> You want me to shift? You want me to have a huge shift? What's happening in the election? What's going on in the election? That might shift everything. Donald 
Trump. Oh, Joe Biden. I don't know. Ruth might have some updates. Because no, I don't. I don't. I can check. I'll check while you ask the last question. So, I mean, circling back to intimacy and, and relationships, um, where to from here for you from an intimacy and relationship perspective? Who knows? I'm open to the journey ahead. Like, really, that's that's really my answer, Lisa. Like, I, I, I really, there's something in me my whole life that has preferred not to specify ever. And yeah. when I think back to, to my favourite moments in life, they've been when I've taken risks because in that moment I felt like doing that. And whether that was going travelling around the world on my own for, you know, nine months or, um, you know, whatever it might be, there were times when it was like, oh, I should be going to uni, but you know what, fuck this, I want to go to India. Bang, save my money and take off to India and Asia and stuff. And, you know, those moments were, <laughs> they were magical. Um, and whenever I've, I've been able to, to actually sort of enter some, something that's, that's more intimate and deeper, it's come out of a, a natural place. So I don't know that I have a specific answer for that. If you know mm. I, I, oh, love, I, great. I love that concept of taking a risk. I think that's really important advice for people. And especially when we are in this state where we are so afraid to do anything. And I think I say it, and I really mean this, I think I say it because it's most what I need to do right now is just take risks again and, and feel okay to do that because there is fear around that. And mm. taking a risk is never present without fear because if there was no fear, there wouldn't be a risk. So yeah, I mean, I, I, there are times when I think the fear is overwhelming and I, and I feel like I want to take a risk, but I don't. And so I'm speaking as much to myself as anything else, but, but in terms of an actual, yeah, sort of like, this is where I think it goes. I've got no fucking idea. Again, I just don't know. Who knows? <laughs> I love it. I love it. It's a great way to end the interview. And so that was Damien Walsh howling. And this is the slow love podcast or vodcast on this occasion thank you ruth so much for being a part of this as well today and, Pleasure. We will... and no news on the election by the time you watch this you'll all know what's happening so it's all good <laughs> awesome and i just well, want to say hope. thank you to both of you thank you so much i've really enjoyed this conversation and um, i'm really glad you're doing a podcast about slow love I think <laughs> thank it's you awesome. damien it's been yeah. a joy to speak with you thank yeah, you, you too. Thank you.